listening to the Money Monopolizers podcast, helping you take control of your financial destiny. It's about time that we invest more in our financial literacy and work towards building generational wealth. If you think you're ready to do the same, then you've come to the right place. Alex, Marlon, y'all ready? Let's get this bread. What's good, everybody? It's Alex Camuno here. We are back with episode 92 of the Money Monopolizers podcast. And I'm here with my co-host, Marlon Walls. Marlon, how you doing today? Are you trying to have like a late night DJ yeah, voice or something? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> late night episode DJ. Episode 92. Okay. <laughs> like, okay. You're listening to episode right. 96.7. <laughs> no, nah, man, I'm doing Oops. straight though, bro. Good. It's a very good time in my life right now. I'm very excited for what's to come. I'm really not even going to mention it, right? Because I'm not going to mention it to this week, but I'll mention it next week. So I'll just leave y'all that little cliffhanger to stay tuned for as far as what's to come. But I'm just, I just want to say that I love the, the factor of having people around you that's causing you to elevate. I think just the power of environment is just everything to me right now because people are at a certain level that are above you and you're at a certain level that's like where everybody, so like people that you grew up with, they may be on a certain level. But there's people that are at a higher level, but they may, may not be in your immediate circle. But you have to be willing to go seek out like that counselship, that mentorship, and be willing to get outside of your comfort zone in order to really start elevating yourself to the next level. And so that's really what I've been doing for the, the past half a year, past, um, you know, like ever since December, I really like just have been expanding my circle and trying to be around more people. And they just continue to pour into me. And the person I'm becoming now has just really helped me to evolve into what a what to much better a much better more confident person so i'm really excited for like what's to come and i just I always think back to um how people were back in like um undergrad people used to always say man i'm, I'm just i just got to get mine i'm getting mine i'm not worried about anybody else especially like on a, a football team that's like one of the ba- main models bro i ain't worried about nobody here i'm getting mine like you that's like the wrong crowd to be around to be honest like i just that's like a scarcity mentality like um, you may have been like deprived and you just want to be the part. You just want to get yours. You don't want you don't care about nobody else around you. And these communities, the community that I'm in right now, just is allowing is everybody just encourages and, and pushes each other to be the best version of themselves. And everybody is just a- able to elevate all together. And I just I don't know. I really love that that community, that environment. So I'm just I just can't say enough about it. So that's kind of where my mentality is right now. Like I'm in a very happy, good place, but overall I'm doing good. House is still closing. We pushed this date back probably like a week already. So it's, I think July 16th will be our new week or our new day for closing just because the appraiser is slow as usual. I expected that. And that's that's nothing unusual about uh, closing in real estate. So everything else is good though, ma'am. How about you? Yeah, that would have been a fast close anyway. It was. I, I, I intentionally told my agent to uh, put a, cl- a fast closing date so we can look more appealing to the uh, seller. And I, in all honesty, I was like, bro, we're going to probably close a week or two later after that. I always say be prepared for six weeks. Childish, uh, but <laughs> that's facts. Yeah, six weeks is usually, which is ridiculous because it's like, bro, we in 2021, like stuff should not be taking that long. Like real estate, as great as it is, the closing process is ridiculous. Um yep. Especially with technology and stuff, I think it's probably gotten faster just after COVID because things became virtual. So that probably you know made things a little faster. But now it's kind of ridiculous. Um, but anyways, that's good though as far as uh, everything else that you know you got going on. Uh, I'm sure that you know those people that you've been meeting and talking to have been super influential into helping you grow and evolve, um, <clears throat> kind of to get into the mentality and the mindset that you're in right now. So it's always good to you know, seek out that outside counsel, however you get it, right? Some people get it um, personally. Some people get it, you know, digital mentors. Some people get it from, uh, I don't know, just, you know, uh, someone they might know, Um, you know, but however you get it, making sure you get that outside perspective is key to growth. Like one hundred monopolizers podcast. Huh? Get it from the money monopolizers podcast, but seek something that's, Seek somebody who's teaching you something above where you currently are. That's really the main takeaway for me. Yeah, man. It's um that's super key. So but yeah, man, everything's been good for me. I just uh I guess it's was well, second week in July now, technically, if you're hearing this. So, but June ended up really being a really good month. So it was um 
great for business. And hit my number thirty five thousand. So now I'm continuing. Oh, I think I said that in the last episode, but still, it's uh, I hadn't officially did it at that point. Yeah, it was just like an estimate, but I've done it. So now I'm kind of just obviously continuing to like focus on growing that, elevating that, and now it's outsourcing stuff. So I'm looking to get into get an operations manager for my business. So especially you know as you know start taking vacations and stuff this summer and this year, I want to have some of that stuff solidified by then, so that I ain't trying to take calls on vacation. Um, you know, like that's, I'm not trying to do that. <laughs> I'm not trying to deal with a Karen vacation. So I'm trying to, <laughs> you know, do that. That's probably going to, I probably need to get started on looking for that now though. Cause it's going to take a while to find that person. I just don't know necessarily the type of person I'm looking for. Cause I just keep going back and forth about, do I want someone that's like, has some experience or do I want someone that has like, I can like they're raw and I can mold like a younger person or even like a stay at home mom or someone like that, that I can kind of like mold into what I want them to be. Cause at that point, right. They're, they're impressionable if they don't have experience, which is something that's attractive to me at the same time. It could be a little rough around the edges because they don't have experience. So I, it's just something I'm thinking about and kind of how I want to start looking for that person to kind of start replacing a lot of the things that I'm doing in a business, which we talked about last week in terms of outsourcing, creating systems. Now that you have, I have had the systems. I've went through every one of my systems myself. Now I can outsource and teach someone how it should be done, right? Because I've put an extensive set of systems that I'm always adding on to. It's like, it's never, a, a, it's never finished. Like even Apple, McDonald's, all these companies are continuing to grow and evolve. I know it. I don't even, I'm not in there in the back operations, but I know they are. Uh, because that's how they got to where they are, right? The first iteration of McDonald's systems is not the w- is iterations they're working on now. And the first iterations of Chick-fil-A, Chick-fil-A might have not even said my pleasure initially. They might have just said, you know, no problem. <laughs> so, but but now it's, you know, they, they've evolved, they've grown, right? They might have, they might not have used peanut oil in the, in the chicken, right? They might have used something else. I don't know. But so as the point is, it's like, I'm always continuing to grow and evolve. So, Always adding to it as you gain more experiences, especially once you start introducing new people, because that's a whole nother, the human factor, the people factor. Now, that's something I'm going to have to take into consideration for the SOPs. But I'm excited, man. It's almost one year in the business coming up in August, August 6th, technically. So my goal is to do 200,000 by the first year. So I need probably like 21,000 more to hit it. So I got to do that by August 6th, which I think I should be able to do. If you can get 35 in June, you should be straight for July, no doubt, I feel like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, that's kind of where I'm at. But I was thinking, too, and this is the last thing I'm going to say, then we'll get into it. But um, because I was was at at the gym, and this is just kind of random, but I thought about it. I was like, man, because I was at the gym the other day, and I uh, this was like on Monday, I think. And I seen this. I got there at like 730, right? And this dude, he got there. I think this dude, I was, I got there at 730. This dude was, I think he had got there probably a little earlier than me because I saw him in there. But it was like 930 when I'm about leaving. I usually stay in the gym about two hours. And this dude was leaving with me. And he was like leaving at the same time. And when it happened, I was like, nah, 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 hold up. Because I, it was just crazy because it's like my, my, my mind couldn't let me leave the gym at the same time at this, as this dude. Because... We he got there a little bit before me, but we was leaving at the same time. And I was like, hold up. Nah. Like I was walking <laughs> out and like he was in front of me and I was like, nah, I gotta go do something more. I gotta go hit some ass some more. I gotta go do something. And I literally like went back in the gym and stayed for like 15, 20 more minutes just because I saw that. And I was like, dang, I really have a problem. <laughs> like I I really have a, a problem with like being like other people or really just like not beating people like i'm addicted to like i whatever it looks like i just have to beat you at something like i don't know what it is about it but it's like it's i at that point i realized it's like i can't even control it because i i in my mind it just happened so easily and i didn't even think about i didn't even like for a second nature yeah like i didn't even for a second think about like now you should leave I was like, oh, now he's leaving. I got to go do some more. <laughs> and it's just like, man. <laughs> no, I, I, I mean, just because I've known you for so long, I can tell you that, that that's a similar trait to the mama mentality anyway. 
Like that's where, that's a lot of what you'll hear, like in, in Kobe documentaries and Michael Jordan documentaries. That's what you're going to hear about, like their mentality. Like they were that type of person that if they saw somebody else working, they're like, well, you can work, but I'm going to work you. Like I'll be in the gym before you and I'm going to get there after you. If you got there before me, I'm going to be in there two hours longer because you got there before me and I got to make up for that. And then next time I come in, I'm going to be in there an hour before when, with the time that I got there this past time because I make sure I beat you in and I'm going to stay in after you. That's just the mentality some people have. And I think I don't want people to take that the wrong way because some people are just built like that. Some people are built to say, I'm never satisfied with where I am. I want to be the best in whatever I do. And that's, I, don't, I personally don't see that there's a problem with that. That's just who you are. There's, if some people will hate you for it, some people will love you for it. And I think it's just about embracing that, that personality type. Like that's somebody that's going to push a organization, push whatever that they're doing, and they're going to like take it without bound they're going to be the best in that field michael jordan and kobe are perfect examples uh they're going to be the one of the best to, they're known to play the game of basketball because they had that mentality people uh, that build million million dollar billion dollar businesses are that type of mentality well a lot of them ha may have that mentality because in order to be the best you have to have you have to hate losing basically so you have to hate being inferior so if you're going to be at the top of the cream of the crop type of person or the, and or a business or whatever it may be you have to have some people will have that killer instinct to say i'm just going to be the best i'm going to be the next person that's beside me and i'm just going to continue to scale and move forward 100 percent. and i to me it's i don't shy away from it i when i say i say it's a problem it's like more so like to me it was just like it's it's a problem in a good way because that is like a positive thing most of the time. But at the same time, sometimes it can have detrimental effects. Um, but if I I would definitely take the positives over it rather than the negatives. And it's like I I embrace it unapologetically because that's just who I am and I, it's just how I, I kind of live my life. I can't even control it. Like it's literally like just something I can't control. Like whatever I'm doing, I just have to try to win and beat people. And it's. <laughs> It's just it becomes almost like an addiction for me. Winning, getting that hit, getting that high of like that feeling of winning. I, I mean, we had a conversation about it in our uh, you know group, but it's I'm more. Bring this. Up. Yeah, it, it's just like I I I see it like in everyday life with everything, even when like driving and like little things. It's like yo, I just want to I just want to pass this dude right now. <laughs> like I don't I don't this dude I don't like sitting behind this dude. I want to be leading the pack. Like, that's just what it is. That's my mentality. I can't control it. And like they say in the Kobe story, they'd be like, yo, that was just Kobe. He's like, man, yeah. that was just Kobe. And I'd be like, yo, that was just Alex. <laughs> that was <Yeah>. just MJ. <laughs> there ain't no problem with it. Now, if you see a problem with it, then you can, nah. at least you're aware of it to the point where you can... Anyway, if you don't see the problem with it, then there's no, no need to change. If you ever do see a problem, then at least you are aware of it to set and to be able to spot when it's happening. And now you can make a decision on if you want to continue on with that attitude or not. But in the reality, if you don't care about it, that's OK. And if other people care that you feel that way, I, I want to reference because when you said the group, I thought about like when we, the conversation we had this past week where we we're talking about in the, um, the Bible story. I want to make this religious, but we talked about um, where these men were trying to. Um, were trying to um, chastise this woman for committing adultery. And uh, they were bringing her to Jesus and saying, hey, we, we need to um, stone this woman. And then Jesus was like, well, the, let the person without sin cast the first stone. Yeah, Everybody had to walk away because because ain't, ain't nobody listening and nobody uh, in the, on this earth not don't have some type of flaw or some type of thing that um, somebody else may not agree with. So... Uh, anybody that has anything anything judgmental to say about that, you need to identify what, what you are not doing that, that 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 is correct or somebody else may not approve of before you start looking at somebody else. Yeah, facts. And to me, I could care less too. If, exactly. Like if you if you heard that and you had to feel some some type of way, congrats. I mean, you know, <laughs> I, I I I really don't care how people feel about what I do or what I, you know, how I live my life. Because at the end of the day, it's like I get results. <laughs> and if you get results that it's like Kobe always said that too like you can feel because obviously he has a reputation for like being a bad teammate not passing the ball that kind of stuff it's like look are we winning <laughs> yes we're winning I'm not here to make friends we're here to I'm here to bring the, a championship to the organization so that's how I approach I'm not saying everything like social stuff is different but like in terms of like when it's serious it's like yo I'm not here to be friends with you i'm here to win winning is the most winning is everything 
And that's just the mentality with it. So it's like, you're not, you, people didn't like, if you, anyone watched The Last Dance, people didn't like MJ. A lot of his teammates didn't like MJ. But whenever he got them a championship, they forgot about all that. They appreciate so, you. They may not like you, but they appreciate and respect you. Yeah, you got to respect it 100%. And I, that's all I, I mean, I, I don't care if you respect me or not, but like at the end of the day, you have to respect it. So, yep. um, but anyways, that was kind of a tangent. But, um, <laughs> we did have a, a good episode uh, this week for y'all. Man, a super hot episode just in terms of everything we got into. This is, as y'all know, if you know me and you've been listening to this podcast for a good amount of time, this is one of my favorite subjects in terms of what we got into with the taxes. Um, I just love this conversation because a lot of people have such misconstrued views on it. So it makes me want to like know more about it because it's like, I don't know what it is that's like makes people misunderstand it. But what we got into today, we really got into a lot of what, you know, the taxes really are like we got into a lot of the not the theory, but a lot of the fundamentals of taxes and why the tax system is the way it is why wealthy people pay less in taxes, why employees pay the most in taxes. Um, and it was with a tax professional, someone that has experience. Because, like, you know, I we've talked about this a lot on the episode. I've done YouTube videos about it. And a lot of people, you you can have, uh, like, a judgment about it because we're not tax professionals and we never claim to be. In fact, we always say this is not tax advice. It's just edutainment purposes. So why is the United States government calling me? <laughs> That's interesting. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so to have a tax professional on the episode, it just solidifies a lot of stuff that we always say, a lot of stuff that we always talk to. And, you know, it was it was it was good because, you know, I, I got to ask him a lot of the tough questions and uh, he can give me his disagreement on some things, which is always appreciated. And uh, it was a great, great episode. It's a wealth, wealth of knowledge in here by Mr. Uh, Larry, Larry West. Yep. And um, he he's doing amazing things right now with his business. He started it within uh, within the last year, and they he said they manage. I want to say it right. <laughs> they have his his clients have nearly two billion dollars in assets. Right, the client the clients he does taxes for. So he's doing taxes for a lot of wealthy individuals. So he definitely knows what he's talking about. So um, what did you think of it though? I just love the perspective that he's able to come with because he's surrounded by people who are doing this on a regular basis. Like they're, he's surrounded by people utilizing these tax strategies and he's able to see the commonality of what they are doing and why they are doing it. Because so now he learns what, what the way strategies to build wealth and then he learns the tax strategies of how to keep your wealth. And so he has a wealth of knowledge just based on who he surrounded himself with. That's why I say the power of community is so big, even if it is from your job in, in his case, or well, start off with his job. And so he built those connections. Now he transferred that to build his own firm. And but it's still the, the same. It's the same principles that are applying, like the people that he's connected with on a daily basis are able to pour into him and show him um, the ways that, that they are building wealth. And then he's able to advise them on the ways to keep their wealth through the tax strategies. And he's able to learn new ways that they may bring up that he may not have thought about. He can go searching more into it or whatever. But I just love the fact that he just has so much that he could we could have discussed on this episode that we probably could have did like a five to seven, 10 part series on just everything and tax related. But I would definitely want people to be sure to tap in with them. If y'all are looking for a tax professional, this would be a great resource for you. So we, the main thing I want y'all to take away from any episode is what can you what can you do after listening? Not just listen to it, say, oh, that was great entertainment. What can you what can you take away from this episode? Are, did you gain a tax professional? Did you learn something new about taxes that you can implement in your business? What did you learn from this episode? So just de definitely be listening in because he's a wealth of knowledge. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So much so. So much so, so much so. So, yes, let's get into it with Mr. Larry West. What up, Larry? How are you doing today? I'm well. I'm well, man. I can't complain. Oh, man. Happy to, happy to, have, happy to have you on here, man. This is definitely, you know, one of the episodes that or one of the topics that I love discussing the most on our podcast is taxes. But... Usually whenever we talk about these, we haven't gotten to talk about it with a actual CPA or a licensed professional. And that's why I always got to give my disclaimer whenever we do talk about these kind of things that I am not a tax professional. And anytime I talk about it, it's just strictly for, I say, edutainment purposes, you know, educational and entertainment person purposes. But 
now that we can introduce, you know, your professional um, perspective to our audience, I think is going to add a ton of value. Um, and so what I, how I kind of want to start this episode, I really want you to first, could you briefly go into like your background as far as like uh, how you got into, um, you know, starting your own tax firm and, you know, I mean, you manage over $2 billion of, uh, or nearly $2 billion of, uh, you know, uh, assets for your clients or your clients have $2 billion worth of assets and started the company in, you know, less than a year ago. So I just want to kind of, you know, hear how you got into that and how you've been able to get connected with so so many uh, individuals and, you know, be able to work for them as far as, you know, these people that have real estate and all these other things. Yeah, man. So, you know, I, I won't give you all the full uh, movie uh, view uh, of the background, but it's, it's kind of a, a jagged path. So I actually, I started in the education space. So I, I was in school, graduated, uh, went right back, got my master's and started teaching uh, English uh, at, at the college level. Right. And so I quickly realized that um, and I, I say this now, but at the time it was a bit selfish. Education just didn't pay me enough. And it didn't pay me fast enough, right? Everything is lockstep. You got to put in this many years to get to this level. You got to do these. And I was like, yo, I, it just wasn't quick enough for me. So I went back right away, got an MBA. And then I thought I was going to be an investment banker, right? Mm-hmm. Wall Street, six figures right out of school. That's, that's what I thought. And my wife decided to move to Abilene, Texas, because she that's where she decided to go for grad school. So we moved to Abilene. And uh, there wasn't no high-profile banking jobs in Abilene, Texas. <laughs> so that was a humbling experience, man. I actually got a job working. Uh, for a financial advisor out there and took a, a took a liking to the tax side of things. And what I really loved about it was the strategy. So most most of the time when people get into tax, they go into preparation. Give me all your stuff. Let me prepare a tax return. Here's what you owe or here's your refund. What I love was from the wealth building side, how do you put things together before the tax return even becomes an issue from a strategic perspective to save on taxes when I figured that out, I was like, yeah, that's where it, that's the sandbox that I need to play in. And then even furthermore, I, I tell you all the profiles that I looked at, all the wealthier clients that we work with, common denominator across the board. If they didn't make their money in real estate, they sure as heck preserved their wealth and, uh, and, and started building a foundation in real estate. And so immediately for me, I was like that I, I have to learn more about how they're doing it, what they're doing. And then my knowledge from a tax perspective, how I can help them. And uh, that kind of led itself to working at traditional CPA firms, doing some tax planning uh, for clients. And I tell you, I just got to a point where I, you, you look at it and for what I was paid as a, uh, uh, from a salary perspective and the amount of work that I did and the rapport, and that's the most important thing, the rapport that I started to build with clients, my value was easily five times what the salary I was making, if not 10 times that to the firm. You, you think about it from the perspective of if this person can afford to pay me X, what am I actually worth? Right. And so I, I, I really honestly decided to go ahead and take a stab and take a chance and jump out and start my own firm. And the reason it's been successful to this point uh, and, and successful beyond what I could have even uh, imagined is the <laughs> excuse me, the relationships that I built with folks. Um, you know, o- over, I didn't just view it as a job. I viewed it as a real opportunity to get to know clients, which gave me the behind the scenes, look under the hood, figure out exactly how things work, uh, which helped me when I, when I'm starting this firm as well. And that's, that's, a that's the cliff notes version of how I got here. A bunch of small little nuggets in between though. Yeah. See that, 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 and that's, it, it just goes back to something that, you know, I think it's super textbook and timeless in terms of the principles for building wealth just in general and what you kind of recognize just by doing that. Obviously, as far as like you were seeing a lot of these wealthy individuals owned real estate, they either built their wealth with real estate or they're preserving their wealth in, in real estate. And that's why, you know, I say that the formula to building wealth is you, you know, start your business, let that give you freedom. And then you take the money from there and you put it into long term assets like real estate, stocks, whatever the case may be. I prefer real estate because of a lot of reasons we're going to get into in this episode in regards to the tax stuff. But I love the fact that you too um, essentially took that same mentality where you said, okay, I know that I'm not getting my worth here um, working for this you know, other company. Because that's at the end of the day, I, I don't even think many people realize that when they are working a job, that they don't, that they think it's like a one-to-one value interchange. No, 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 it's not. Because whenever you work for a business, it's a business. And, and you are an investment. 
you're a person, but you're an investment to that business because you're a part of the system. So for them, they must be getting three to five times more than they are paying you, right, to justify paying you, right? And so that's essentially, you know, the reason that I think many, many people should consider, you know, starting a business. I'm not going to sit here and say that everyone needs to be a business owner, but if you understand the fact that, you know, your value you're not get you're not getting paid your worth when you're working the job. It's just mathematically impossible. Like if I am a business owner, I can't. If I'm gonna make a hundred thousand dollars a year based off of hiring you, I can't pay you a hundred thousand dollars a year. I'm gonna have to pay yeah. you twenty five thousand dollars a year. So I love that, man. Yeah, but then just just what I wanted to get into. I mean, it goes a lot to what Alice was just saying anyway, because we love that know your worth conversation. Like a lot of people don't ever understand how valuable that they really are when they're working for somebody else. Like somebody be paying you a certain amount and you think that you're worth that amount. No, that's usually the, the that's usually the uh, the bid that the the job is uh, placed on you. So twenty five dollars an hour up to a hundred dollars an hour. That's just that was just your your employer's bid. That's not necessarily what you're worth. That's just what somebody was willing to pay you. But you're gonna be worth a lot more than that. You can look at people like Jeff Bezos who's making billions of dollars a year. They're not making uh, any anywhere near a hundred dollars an hour like they, they knew their own worth and said i'm gonna build something that's gonna pay me what i'm worth rather than working for somebody else who who would never even match anywhere close to what i'm worth but now with with that being said though because we hear this a lot of times when it's when we're talking to somebody that started as an employee but transitioned to saying you know what I'm do, I know that I'm doing I can do this work really well. I can do taxes really well. I, I've learned a lot of the strategies in my business or in working for this person that it takes to um, to do this on at a high level. Now, a lot of people take that and what, what, and have what's called um, from the e-myth, the, an entrepreneurial seizure where they say, you know what, I can go start this on my own. I can I can go be my own business owner, my own boss. And I think this really segues well into um into what our conversation is going to be about today because now they go off and start their own company they start their own firm their own business and little do they know that there's way more to that business besides just um doing the taxes or doing the actual uh physical transactions or the work there's now that you have management you have a uh, bookkeeping you have tax planning you have all this other th all these other things that um, you do not have to do as just the employee in somebody else's company. And so now I want to start asking you, like, uh, what? how are you prepared to make that transition? Like, what things did you have to learn and what things were you able to implement so that you were able to transition from an employee to a business, true business owner, where you had systems in place and the things that were allowing you to, to thrive as a business owner rather than um, a, a, the self-employed person who is, like, struggling because they don't know anything else about anything besides the actual product itself? Yeah, you know, that's a phenomenal question. And I tell you, it, it's really, it really comes down to two things, right? The first thing is money, right? The, and, and this is, different people have different philosophies, but this is the way I think of it. And this is how I advise everyone who asks that question is, if you are going to leave and you truly want to build a business, you got to make sure you either have a plan for, or you already have reserves in place. Because what will tend to happen is you're going to get out there. You're not going to have any reserves in place and you will start making decisions based on money, decisions out of desperation. So said differently, if I stepped out and I didn't have any reserves, my plan would be to build a tax strategy firm. But what I would start doing, because I need money, is tax prep. I'd start taking on any and every client. I'd start doing, uh, you know, I'd probably start selling legal shield or something like that, right? <laughs> I start doing all these other things to get cash flowing in, which takes away from the thing that I initially set out to do. And so if you don't have the reserves already, surely have a plan for having those reserves so that you don't have to make decisions out of desperation purely based on money. And the second thing is realize you are not starting a business based on the specific thing that you're going to be doing, the specific service, right? So in my mind, sure, tax strategy, business advisory services, that's what we do. But the business that we have is a collection of systems and processes to execute. So when I left the firm that I was with, I understood that the reason that that firm worked, not just the employees, obviously, it worked because there's a collection of systems and processes in place that allow everything else to flow. So here I am when I first started out, you know, they call it the, the chief everything officer, right? Just like you described, right? You're, 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 you're the person who opens, you're the person who closes, you're the janitor, you're the bookkeeper, you're, and you're also the person who's supposed to sell your good product or service. Mm -hmm. um, but when you have systems in place, that allows you to easily create opportunities to either outsource 
or systematize everything so that you can go on and be great. So a lot of our, a lot of the stuff that we do is handled by assistants where I've written out, this is step-by-step step exactly what I want you to do. And that allows me to go be great at client facing, which is kind of my core strength there and the financial analysis side to give the strategy. If I'm sitting here trying to respond to emails, I can't do all that stuff at the highest level. So systems and processes and having reserves, I think are the foundational things. Everything else starts to fall in place after that. Hey man, that's, we, because <laughs> we took, we did a whole episode on that last week and yep, yep. people going to sit here and, you know, say, we, they, they might've sat there and said, man, y'all don't know what you're talking about. Well, now someone else, you're getting it, you're hearing it live from someone else. Exactly. So it, it, it's a, like, it's a tried and true principle. You must set up a business to be a business in order to get business results and not side hustle results. And that comes from setting up systems and SOPs, standard operating procedures, in order to allow you to be the entrepreneur, right? You, there's a difference between the entrepreneur and the uh, technician or the employees, right? As the entrepreneur, your job is to be the visionary and to move the company forward. The every, so, so that's done by allowing all those other tasks that aren't moving the company forward to be outsourced to other people so that you can focus on the most uh, revenue generating activities yep. uh, for 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 your business, and so yep. you know those systems are are so key. So I'm so glad that uh, you mentioned that too, because it's just you know again it proves it. So, and I, what I I'll also say really, really quick here too, it's a, it's an investment that that you're making, right? When when you decide to outsource that stuff to someone else who's truly great at it, you look at it as I'm giving this to them, not so I can spend money but so that it frees me up to make more than what I would if I were doing it. So it's another thing that for folks to keep in mind. Sorry to interrupt. No, for, for sure. That just goes back to what we were talking about earlier too, in terms of the, uh, you know, getting paid your value. Cause you know, you're, the people you're outsourcing to, they're going to get paid for based off of the value that they're creating. They're not going to get paid the same way as you, obviously, cause you know, the entrepreneur, they're the one that creates the most value, which is why, you know, CEOs like, you know, uh, Steve Jobs, rest in peace, and also to, um, you know, the current Apple CEO, they get paid a lot more than a lot of the employees. It's just based off of value, man. So I love that. Um, so I want to kind of transition, obviously, into more so some of the uh, uh, tax kind of topics based off of that I really want to get into, because that's what I really want this episode to be about so that we have um, a go-to person um, and a go-to episode for this subject, right? And... I have very strong views <laughs> about, you know, the tech, like very, very, very strong. I've done some YouTube videos. And again, I'm not a financial uh, uh, or a, a tax professional. So I can, I only provide my perspective based on what I know. I never claim to be, I, you know, a lot more to me. So I'm going to defer to you on a lot of this stuff, but I was, I want to present my perspective and my takes on this, some of this stuff. So before I really want, before we get into kind of, you know, some of, some of the spicy stuff, can we can we can you talk more so from your perspective? I want people to understand from a fundamental level what really are taxes based off of you know your experience and what you know. Can you explain what taxes really are? When you say what they really are, uh, you mean like a, a revenue source for the government or that's that, <laughs> that, that <laughs> verbatim. Said it verbatim. That and, was, 100%. and we didn't even rehearse that, right? No, one hundred percent. So but that yeah. that truly is what they are. Ta taxation is set up so that it creates a revenue source for the government to carry out things. Now, on one end, they the the idea is that it's carried out for the good of the people, right? The government has to be funded so that it can, it can govern, it can provide resources, it can protect us, and all these other things. Um, Depending on what uh, side of the aisle folks are on, they have different perspectives on how those tax dollars should be spent. But it is essentially revenue. It's money for the government to be able to operate. We don't pay taxes. Government don't got no money. Right. Or at least they don't have any value behind the money that they're uh, that they're printing. So that's essentially what it comes down to. Yes, exactly. One hundred percent is a, he said it. I'm so glad you said it that way because it's leading. This is actually going really well so far. So <laughs> one thing, <laughs> one thing, because to me, OK, so when I um, because I, I like to read a lot about like some of this stuff. And one thing that I saw was that actually I think they said 86 percent of the government's revenue comes from employees. Right. 
and uh, so W-2 workers, right? So, mm -hmm. and I think the breakdown was 50% was individual income taxes, 7% was uh, corporate income taxes, and 36% was payroll tax. So 50% and 36%, like the, the individual income taxes and then the payroll taxes that the employers pay, that's all based off of employees, right? Mm -hmm. So a very large majority of the um, government's revenue as we've just identified what taxes are, right? So that's how I want people to kind of think of this throughout this episode is that taxes are just the government's, remember, it's an internal revenue service. So it's, that's just exactly. that's the thing. So there, it's, it's how they generate money. And so most of their income and revenue is coming from employees. So that being said, that's, that's going to segue into a lot of stuff that we're going to kind of talk about. But th th based on that, does that kind of sound like it, it's accurate, though, just based off of, you know, your experience? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that's not a stretch. That's not an exaggeration or anything like that. It truly is a revenue source. And the majority of it does come from employees. And the reason is, uh, empl uh, when you're on the W-2 side of things, you have the least amount of flexibility from a tax perspective. Yeah. What you make is what you make. And then the, the, the tax, the way the system is set up, uh, especially from a payroll tax side of things, you're basically locked in. And even on the amount of money that you earn from a federal income tax perspective, you don't have the same uh, uh, privileges that business owners, independent contractors, or corporations have to take deductions against the money that you're earning. Yeah. Now, some people may say, well, you got itemized deductions. That's one thing. Yes, but there are limits before you get there, and there are a whole lot of things that have to go right in order for you to really be successful on that side. Uh, but the, the true perspective is, I, and this, is, this, this right here is a little bit more um, pers uh, personal perspective than anything else. Tax code is basically written for people who own assets and people who own businesses. Everyone else, you just kind of fall in line and you got to take whatever they give you. Yeah. For yeah. people who own assets and businesses, you got flexibility to do different things. Uh, but those people are, are also the um, job creators. So, yeah. you know, there, there's, some op there's some things to be considered there. And, and, and that's the, man, we could really end the episode there. But that's like, <laughs> that's like, I always want people to understand that because obviously we're in a culture where it's like, you know, tax the rich, tax the wealthy, tax everyone, everyone. If you make a lot of money, you should pay a lot of money in taxes. But people don't really understand the whole concept of taxes. So this is why this is a very important conversation, right? Because I know the tax code is very extensive. Like, isn't it called the, the IRC, the Internal Revenue Code, right? It's yep. very extensive. It's tens of thousands of pages. I don't know how many pages it is. But what I do know is that v many... Very few of these sections actually tell you what you have to pay, while a majority of them tell you, you know, ways that you essentially don't have to pay, right? In terms of uh, how to leverage the tax code to your benefit, if you, you know, which is available to everyone. And like you said, the people that actually do do it are typically the people that have a the people that are able to leverage it, the people that have assets, and the people that create jobs and those kind of things. Because I always see it as, you know, if I'm a job creator. If I'm an entrepreneur, I'm getting taxed. Like the tax code is an incentive system for me to continue to do what I do because now I'm helping the economy, right? I'm helping by me creating jobs, the government is able to make more money because they can tax those jobs as W-2 and I can, you know, take the benefits of that. So that's the way I always tell people to look at it is just not to be so, you know, dramatic about it. What do you actually think about that whole you know, thing of like tax the rich, tax the wealthy. And, you know, like, you know, I think, uh, what's his name? Um, Bernie Sanders talking about a wealth tax, those kind of things. I'm not, I don't want to make this a political thing, but just in right. terms of your perspective on it. No, you I, if you stick to the facts, right. Um, regardless of, of what people say, when, when you're dealing with corporations that employ large amounts of people, uh, the, the narrative is typically these corporations don't pay any tax. They made billions of dollars. They paid zero in tax. What they're essentially paying zero on tax is federal income tax, yeah. which means that they're either reinvesting in the business or spending money on their employees. Um, you know, sometimes that's disproportionate because a lot of that does tend to go to executives and not necessarily to frontline folks. But they are paying a few different taxes on the state and local side. They're usually paying business property tax. They are uh, paying um, uh, state unemployment tax on the federal side. They're paying uh, employment tax said differently, FICA said differently, Social Security and Medicare tax, which at the volume that they employ people, you know, that could be a really substantial amount that goes in that goes into the government. And so while they're paying zero 
federal income tax, they are paying taxes in other places, sales tax being another one. Mm -hmm. Now, the other side of that is when you talk about a wealth tax, the problem that typically comes into place is the government is starting to inadvertently penalize income generators and not necessarily wealth holders. Mm -hmm. The difference is, right, as business owners, we're out here working hard, we're generating income, and the more we make, the more our tax bracket rises, right? So Mm -hmm. Joe Biden is talking about taking this from uh, the currently the highest is 37% all the way up to 39.6% and different things like that. So for us, we're creating income, and the more we create, the more we're going to be taxed. But someone like a Bezos, someone like a uh, Bill Gates, a Warren Buffett, they have wealth that's that by way of the ownership inside of their companies, right? So they, they're, what they're trying to figure out is how do we get access to the wealth that those people have uh, because it's typically passed down for generations in a very tax advantageous way. So I think a, a real conversation needs to be had about uh, small business owners because the majority are, are kind of in that, in that middle ground and how do we continue to incentivize them without raising their taxes uh, but making sure everyone pays their fair share. Yeah. See, Ma, I'm gonna hog it if you don't go. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, I know this is so past the subject, so I expected, I expected it already. Yeah. Well, I mean, so I'm a, I'm a, I just want to comment. Then you can say so, because to me, that the whole thing with that is, I think that's because obviously it's like a conversation of, like, the government. Typically, what happens is there's like unrealized gains and realized gains, right? So mm-hmm. when you own assets like stocks or even real estate to an extent, they increase in value. If you don't mm-hmm. ever pull out the extract the value you will never pay taxes on that right it'll just sit there right but the moment you extract it now it introduces the 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 tax um you know conversation because now you're realizing those gains and the government's like hey wait wait, you know uncle sam he needs his cut too so that's that that's a whole nother and i think a lot that's why a lot of people don't get to in terms of like when they say you know jeff bezos he he's a billionaire but he needs to pay all his he needs to pay you know taxes it's like most of that money, it's he's not. It's not in his bank account. Yeah, it's it, it's sitting yeah. in equity in, in his company. Yeah, and you know what, what they tend to think, um, or at least some of the proposals that we've seen so far, right? So you've got one that's floating out there where they're saying, "Hey, companies that make over X millions of dollars doesn't matter if they generate if they drive their revenue all the way to zero, they're going to pay a tax on any top line revenue, any gross revenue that they earn over X amount." Mm. You know. Good or bad, I, I'm not here to, to judge on whether or not that works, but I, I think what you inadvertently create is kind of a, a spur of, of additional companies. Now the money is being spread between, instead of one company, five or 10, mm-hmm. to make sure no one goes above that threshold. Uh, so you're not necessarily getting getting the, the tax dollars that, that you wanted, but meanwhile, those that are climbing the corporate ladder, increasing their salary, they're gonna get hit hard, right? But the folks that they were really going after, which are the billionaires, they're, they're just making more strategic moves to get out of paying that tax. And so I don't know that it's going to um, do, a, do a lot of good, at least not yet. So uh, the, the ideas sound great, but when you get into the details of how it works and the different strategies that could go behind it, are we really accomplishing that goal? I don't know. <laughs> See, now, that, that's, now that's one thing I did want to hit on because this really boils down to the fact that some people seek the advice of how to, of like how to get these tax benefits, while some other people say, "No, nah, I'm not spending no money on anybody. Like I'll just go hand to hand, pay my taxes. I do my own thing." So I'm thinking about like the self-employed or the employee versus the business owner and the investor. The business owner or the investor are the ones that are working with CPAs. Like these are the, the all the people who own real estate or have started these businesses that that you work with. They're coming to you religiously. Like you're gonna probably have more of those type of clients than you will somebody just like the standard employee or the self-employed uh, like the small business owner because they know that there are strategies that are out there that can help them pay less in taxes if they implement those strategies however um most people are going to see that and well, going to um, see a, the name cpa or see the name um tax professional and think oh my i've spent a lot of money to, to get that to get that help so i'm, I'm just going to avoid it all together so now you're pretty much stabbing yourself in the foot because they could be saving you a lot more than what you're paying them in the first place and because you are too tight holding on to your money now you have to now you're going to be the one getting hit big time like the, those um people making lots of money per or like the high salary earners or the small business owners that refuse like to get to tax professional help like to um learn how to streamline their money into different wealth building opportunities like um because that was 
that she did for me when you said talk about income generators versus the wealth uh, holders like uh, uh i think you said wealth holders but um i, I want to like get into um what type well, of strategy question real quick, question real quick on on i want a question for larry based off what you just said because what marlon just said was essentially like you know a lot of uh people that earn their money from jobs and you know they increase their income they don't necessarily want to go to a tax professional right uh, but uh, as opposed to business owners they know they need to go to tax professional in order to save money on taxes i personally believe that that's i mean as an employee do sure. you really need to be going to a tax professional i mean you don't have any deductions because we know it uh, you know how how it goes it's well, you know maybe that, this is why we need to get into this conversation. And, and, and yeah. that's why I wanted to talk about that. So please yeah. go ahead. So I, I, you look at it as an investment, right? If your person costs you more than what they're able to save you or make you, then yes, it's an absolute cost and you should look elsewhere. But when you go to a strategist, that being a CPA, an EA tax professional or, or the like, who can understand your situation and come up with different ideas to help you reduce your tax bill, well, that's an investment. Even if I'm a W-2, I make $150,000 a year. And uh, if I go to H&R Block or if I use TurboTax, you know, 250, 350 bucks. But if I go to my CPA, it's 1200 bucks. Yeah. That's a huge jump. But if my CPA can look at my situation and teach me how to go from a $20,000 tax bill down to, say, a fifteen dollars or $14,000 tax bill, that's $1,200 well spent. Yeah. And a lot of folks may not think about that. And they also make those assumptions that, if I'm a W-2, I don't have a lot of options. When, if you're a W-2 and you're a higher income earner, the options open up for you. You know, uh, they're, they're not as robust as they are for business owners, but they can get pretty darn substantial. There are different things that you can do. And when I say high in, higher income earner uh, on the W-2 side, I would say people that have W-2s that are about 200 to a quarter million dollars or more, I think some unique strategies may be on the table for, uh, for them to explore. Uh, for everyone else, uh, I, I think there are some things that you can do as well. You know, you probably don't need the $1,200 tax return, but you still need the conversation with the tax professional to see what moves you can make. Um, and we can get into some of those or, or uh, you know. And, and so, OK, I am going to put you on a hot seat just for a little bit, because I, I, I'm very curious myself to learn about this, because if let's say I'm making two hundred seventy five thousand, three hundred thousand dollars, majority of it coming from W-2 income. And I am, you know, I, I have my, I got my 401k, so I get my tax deduction for that. I got my, I own a property, so I get my interest deduction from that. I got kids. So beyond like those, you know, pretty standard deductions, what other deductions is available for that person that's making a quarter million dollars from a W-2 job? Because I'm very curious for myself, because I, based on my, what I know, it's like, I didn't even know if you had anything beyond that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, at, at that rate, you you probably have you probably own um, you know your house and, and different things like that, right? So you got your itemized deductions and, and all that other stuff. A couple of core things. One, we would sit down and talk about a Roth strategy because uh, depending on where you are in your earning years and your career trajectory, you're at two you know two fifty or whatever. Now you're probably going to start earning more in your later years. So a Roth strategy may be one that's valuable. Here's what I'd look at. I'm doing the four hundred one k. But instead of making the pre-tax deduction, do I just bite the bullet and make a Roth contribution instead? Mm -hmm. Pay taxes today, get to take it out tax-free later on. But then does the 401k uh, at my job allow me to make after-tax contributions? Now, this is where it can get super, super fun, right? Because we know right now the, any employee can make $19,500 contribution to their 401k, all right? May want to make that as a Roth contribution instead of a pre-tax contribution. Of course, you're going to pay taxes today, but you're setting this up for the future. If your employer also allows you to make after-tax contributions, you can jump that 19.5 pretty quickly up to 30, 40, or even 57 thousand dollars, right? Putting in that that dip that that delta that difference. Yeah, that allows you to now go from having only being able to put 20 thousand dollars in a retirement account to possibly 40 or 50 thousand dollars. That grows tax-free over time. So now when you get to the later stage, you can now pull that money out without any tax implications. So you can basically supercharge or super fund your Roth 401k. The same can be done uh, on the, uh, uh, or excuse me, something similar can be done on the IRA side. So you can do what they call a, a backdoor Roth. Um, the other thing is using the HSA. A lot of us have high deductible plans at work. The HSA could be a really valuable investment. Most of us think HSA is a health savings account, right? 
we think we go to the doctor, I put money in this HSA. If I got a x-ray bill or I got prescriptions, I swipe my HSA card and, and you know, they pay for it. Uh, that's great. That's the way to use it. But the HSA is a pre-tax uh, account. So you get the tax deduction for making the contribution into it. There are no income limits on, uh, on, uh, on you know, limiting who can make the contribution as long as you uh, have a, a high deductible plan to go with it. But then did you know you could also use your HSA potentially to invest in things? Yeah. I know somebody who used their HSA to invest in uh, cattle. Like, you know, the cattle that you have outside. of So you can use these vehicles in a lot of different ways, uh, even though you don't have access to business deductions. There are still some st st uh, strategic things you could do on the tax side. And even using charitable uh, trusts, if you're an all, uh, a, a super high income earner and you are a charitably minded person, you can use charitable trusts to get large deductions to reduce your income um, and also still support the charity that you wanted to use. So they have options, but you don't know these unless you sit down and, yeah. invest and talk with a tax professional 100 percent. and i think that was i mean that was amazing thank you for going to that marlon go ahead <laughs> no there's i think you could have like a four to ten part series on everything that we could talk about today there's so <laughs> many different avenues we can go down i do want to at least bring it to our audience though because i think we talk where we target an audience that may be working a nine to five but at the same time they see that there's different opportunities out there such as in entrepreneurship or investing yeah. so i really want to talk to those i want to like cater the conversation toward those people so yeah. if they're looking to get into like some type of small business that they want to start their own business or they want to start getting like into real estate investing one thing that they that you always hear is that you got to set up some type of entity some type of structure like a s corp c corp llc sole proprietorship and there's just so many options that they don't know about that they don't even know where to start and so like how do you cater toward that well how do you adv best advise that person like what are some key things to look for with different businesses or different investments to tell you how to best protect it or if you should even start there in the first place versus just getting started in the business without any asset protection yeah so first uh they'll want to go to my website and sign up for my uh tap workshop no i'm just joking <laughs> <laughs> for sure so, i'll talk about that no. so you know th this is a uh, it's truly though shameless plug but not so much this is truly what we teach during the tap workshop which is tax and asset protection entity formation is first right but you have to also think how you make your money uh, i always start with this how you make your money informs how that money is going to be taxed so if you're thinking about starting a business are you thinking about doing a business where you provide a service, you know, maybe consulting or, or something like that? Are you thinking about selling goods and products? Uh, if so, then there are a few things that you should keep in mind. You should essentially look at uh, an LLC, which is a limited liability company. That's kind of 101, right? Because you want to separate the liability between yourself and, and the company. Uh, but then you'll start to look further down the line at potentially um, electing to be treated as what we call an S corporation, because that'll help you save on employment tax. But if you're on the other side and you're looking at buying assets, specifically buying real estate, no reason you should have a corporation. You shouldn't be doing an S corp or a C corp. If you're doing buy and hold uh, real estate, right, where you're going to buy and own that asset, then an LLC is fine. There are certain stipulations if you're going to have um, loans from a bank and, and different things like that. And I'll, I'll talk about the appropriate structure where you can get around those, those things here once we get into it. But that's the thing you got to understand which is why it's important to have the conversation with your CPA, tax professional, and or your attorney before you get started. And it's worth whatever their consultation fee is to do it right, because we cost a whole lot more to help you unwind it than we do to help you get it right. So, uh, you know, goods and services, LLC, consider the S corporation. If you're doing buy and hold real estate, a simple LLC is all you're going to need. And then we'll, we'll get into some more of the other things. So, okay. Cause I'm, this is very I'm I'm so glad you mentioned that because this is a a very hot topic in terms of like people getting into entrepreneurship in terms of like, you know, LLC, 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 just want to start LLC because people get excited about starting LLC. Right. Especially mm -hmm. when we talk about real estate, right, with the buy and hold stuff, even flipping houses to an extent. Right. It's good to have it. But I'm always an advocate. Just I, I want to get your opinion because that's, again, why you're here. I always say, look, your first deal. You prop like because we got to understand the concept of what the LLC is for, right? It's to separate, like you said, the liability from your personal assets, asset, personal assets to versus the business, right? But mm -hmm. when you're first starting, most people, you don't even have any personal assets to lose, right? So it's like there are, I always say, I think because, you know, we have properties ourselves, we flip houses and those kinds of things. And starting off, we didn't necessarily buy our first properties in the LLC. Number one, 
it was, you know, there's a lot of like financing stuff, which we'll talk about in a second, how you said we can go around it. Um, but it was also like, I could get, if I really wanted to, you know, protect myself and I really wanted to get this property in LLC, but I couldn't, I said, cool, I can just get more insurance on this property and that'll cover me in the case. Like I can just increase the insurance. Right. And so that was always an option that was there as well because it's going to, it's, it was, it's harder for a lot of people to actually get started with an LLC. And it was more so just like a thing where people just wanted to do it just because they said they want to have LLC, which I understand the concept, but at the end of the day, if you didn't have any personal assets to actually protect because, you know, you don't own a house or you just have debt, there's nothing for really for the, you know, to go after in litigation. What do you, say to that and if you disagree with that please uh let me know yeah so i i i'm, I'm a little bit on the other side closer to to disagreeing with that in that um the assumption is you don't have any personal assets but then you have to dig deep do you really not have i mean do you have a checking account with money in it do you have a house that you own do you have a vehicle that you own do you have um perhaps another small startup business that you're doing with another friend that may not be off the ground yet you got all these different uh, lines of exposure that may not be immediate right away. I and mean, if you truly have nothing, nothing, then yeah, you're absolutely right. But there are, are small nuances that you're just not aware of that you have that could be exposed. And the thing is, and this would probably probably be more towards the legal side. Um, I don't know that there's a statute of limitations on the liability, right? Uh, in some cases there are, but you know, we could get started today and we go do a deal or a transaction and we don't use any type of protection, no LLCs or nothing like that. And great, that deal closed. And we decide we're going to get serious, go form an LLC and start doing everything under our business. A year or two later, what if something happened that we just weren't aware of and they come back? Now personal stuff is exposed. And so uh, the, the the cost for setting up the LLC in most states is is fairly small. Uh, unless you're in California, then it's ridiculous. <laughs> Everyone else is like, 150 mm-hmm. Texas worth 300 bucks California is like 800 that's oh, nuts God, but ridiculous, bro. <laughs> and it's 800 dollars per year per LLC to oh to, my gosh yeah yeah so <laughs> they run it up right that which is why a lot of people from California are running oh. over here to where we are yeah. um so you know I think the the nominal cost of the LLC uh helps protect any potential exposure or risk down the line um and you're right insurance is a great way to mitigate against it uh but I yeah, I just like the entity a little bit better. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes 100 percent. So just in terms I want to touch on this briefly, too, because I know there's some little more stuff we want to get into. So as far as like actually going around, can you talk about actually buying one of your first properties in an LLC, how that can actually be done successfully? Because that's a I mean, I don't even know how you can go <laughs> get around that. And then also, let's say you already bought some properties in your personal name. Um, they're obviously still have a mortgage, but you want to get them, tra- you want to get it transferred into a LLC that you already own. Uh, how can you talk about both of those scenarios briefly? How, if that can be done and how it can be done? Yeah. Yeah. So, so typically if you, if you're going to buy and hold this property and you need leverage, you're not doing creative finance and you're traditionally, I'm going to a bank to get some money to do this, to do this particular deal. Um, uh, especially when you're brand new, the bank is going to look at you and say, nah, not nah, player. We want you on this loan, not the right. LLC. Yeah, you know, yeah. your LLC, it, it, ain't, it ain't got enough assets for us to really attach ourselves to. But you, you got a salary, you got a house, you got a car. We know we can get some money from you. So um, typically, they're going to require that you buy it in your name first. And then what we've heard is that a lot of people will then turn around and do what they call a quick claim deed or, or some iteration of that and then deed it into the LLC. Um, you know, you absolutely want to talk to legal counsel before you do that. But I do know in some cases, depending on the type of loan that you have, you could trigger what they call a due on sale or due on transfer clause, Mm -hmm. which you want to try to avoid that as much as possible. So one way around that, instead of deeding it into the LLC, you introduce what's called a land trust. A land trust helps you get around that due on sale clause. And so the property is now owned. The beneficial owner of that property is now the land trust. The trustee of that land trust just so happens to be an LLC. The manager of that LLC is your holding company. So that's your, and I'm, again, let me, let me do the disclaimer. I should have said that that's not specific tax advice. Don't go out there and set that up without consulting your own tax professional and legal counsel, but that's a strategy that you can look into. Use the land trust as opposed to the LLC. um, And that way you don't trigger the due on sale clause. And then all of the tax benefits stay the same on the back end. 
See, yeah, that, that was free game right there. That's that's course worthy right there. Um, and I wanted to hit into that same exact thing that I was asked anyway because a lot of people have a an issue with starting up a business or starting up an LLC, or opening a business account that has no true history behind it, but they want to at least be able to start getting funding uh, for that for this company to get off the ground. Like so, now a lot of people are going to see entrepreneurship or starting a small business as something that they can't obtain because there's an obstacle in the way. And the obstacle is usually money, credit, something like that, that's preventing them from even getting into that field. So now how do, do they go about uh, getting the LLC to the point where they can, where it looks uh, um, looks looks pleasing to the banks, like so that the bank would be willing to work with you as an LLC? Yeah, so, so two things are going to happen there. One is longevity, so you can't do anything about time, but wait that out. Uh, they're going to want to see time, and then they're going to want to see history of transactions, uh, specifically in the space that you're trying to get lending for. Uh, so, you know, if you have an LLC that's doing business in the real estate space, but then you're trying to get a loan to go buy, um, you know, machinery to do some other stuff, they're going to be like, no, you don't have any experience in that space. So longevity and, and history in that particular space, and then a history of transactions. And then the other side is you don't want to go nuts with writing off all of your deductions. That's a yes. common conversation that we have because most people want to make a lot of money and pay no taxes because they think they want the Donald Trump plan. But <laughs> understand there are strategies that go in place and the strategy is not run up your deductions, right? You want to show that you are operating a profitable business. Mm -hmm. So if you're making you know $100,000 in your business, you shouldn't also be showing $30,000 of loss unless it's a true loss, right? But you know you don't have to run everything. And here's the other thing to keep in mind. There's nothing that says you have to claim every single expense. OK, so I made 100,000 and I truly have $50,000 of expenses. If I choose, I may just so happen to claim 30. You know, I may not claim the other 20,000. And what does that do? It kicks my tax bill higher, but it makes me more presentable yeah, when it comes to the other side of things. So uh, that that's a that's something to keep in in, uh, in consideration. So you know you may just want to not claim your cell phone expense. You may just want to not claim mileage and some of those other things to make yourself look uh, presentable. But you got to balance that because a tax bill is going to follow. That's that that's a that's a that's a great point too because I don't think a lot of people think about that because you just think about I just don't want to pay anything in taxes. But you don't think about the fact that it's not making you bankable. To a lot of banks, and we talked about that. I think in episode sixty-seven with um, what was his name, Michael Ely, when we talked because he he owns a bunch of commercial real estate, right? And obviously, which we're going to get into here in a minute with commercial real estate, you get huge <laughs> tax deductions just through depreciation and all that kind of stuff. But yeah. something that kind of happens is you know you can become less bankable to yeah. banks because you actually don't. Like, it, it's like a. It's really like that's. That's a tough kind of situation to be in in terms of like determining how much I actually want to claim as a loss versus how much, you know, you actually it's like a double edged sword. So yeah, I'd say and, and you, I, I look at it as an investment. I just had this yeah. conversation literally two months ago with a client uh, who, you know, based on this particular transaction that he had to get funded for, we had to dial back the expenses and that triggered a fourteen thousand dollar increase to the tax bill. And the question was, he, I mean, he was upset. He's like, man, I got to pay 14. And I was like, well, listen, on the deal. How do you recoup your 14K? How do you restructure your deal in a way that your 14K comes back to you and all you're doing is making an investment right now? Now, that doesn't mean that this is a true transaction, like you get an ROI on the tax bill that you pay. That's not what it's like. <laughs> I'm thinking mentally when you think about it, you got a $14,000 cost because you got to pay taxes. This deal that you get into, can that be beneficial to make it worth your while? Yeah. Yep. And that was this is so huge, man. Like people don't really understand that that aspect of it because everybody is seeing, oh, this company pays zero in taxes. Trump pays zero in taxes. I want to do the mm -hmm. same thing. I'm hey, talk to my CPA. I want to take. I want to deduct every single thing that I possibly can. Two years later, they're, they're going looking at banks. Hey, bank, I've had my bank, my LLC open for two years. Time to get a loan. They look at you like, my God, you lost money both years, and you want me to give yeah. you money so you can lose that and not pay me too, like. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not doing this with you. Like, wait, wait, I and didn't then, actually lose it. <laughs> wait, no, wait, yeah, yeah, no, those are write-offs. Like, I, I made a lot. Look, my, I made money, yeah. sir. And that's not what your tax black and white. Say. Yeah, your tax returns don't say that. You can, uh, try another year, but yeah, I wanted to hit on that well, point. He, let it, he was going to say something. Let him. Like, he was going to say something. Well, no, I, I was going to say really quick on 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 when people talk about the the Trump plan and things like that. One, 
I'm, I'm pretty sure some of the most highly compensated people on Trump's uh, team are his advisors, specifically probably his tax advisor. So uh, that, that should tell you something, right? But on the other side of that, he uses a multitude of strategies. And, you know, until his tax returns are fully uncovered, we won't know exactly what those strategies are. We could speculate. I think I got a good idea of what at least what two or three are. But he uses a number of different strategies um, to get these things done. But he also has a history, right, of doing different deals. And so um, not that any bank would necessarily touch him now. But at one point when he was was kind of growing, he had the history to support you know, look at the value of the buildings of the projects that I've done. You'd be crazy not to give me money to go on and do this next one. So. Yeah. yeah, that's facts too. And I, I wanted to ask like one more elementary question before we start getting into the real estate discussion. But like for people that are starting out that business for the first time and they are um they can't finance anything in their business name, so they're they're running a lot of the personal like they're handling everything offhand like just through their personal name, but they're running it in the business to show that it's profitable. Um, how does that person go about as far as the tax purpose, what saving for taxes, uh, like for that for that bill that's to come? I think because I think a lot of people may um, run it out of their business, but then they they also may be extracting money from their business at the same time, just like for their normal everyday expenses. So they're not really able to show that growth, and then they may get hit with the surprise tax bill later on at the end of the year because everything that they were spending on like their personal wasn't necessarily business expenses; they were just buying a, a, a um, I don't know a, a meal at Burger King or something. Yeah. So two things there. Number one, immediately stop it right away. Do not commingle business and personal. If you if your business doesn't have the cash and you have the money personally, then take the extra time to transfer from your personal into the business account and then go spend the money that way. Right. You want clear lines of sight and how the money goes, yeah. because when you start to commingle, you one pierce the corporate veil and mm -hmm. two, you make yourself look ridiculously terrible and guilty when an audit springs up. OK, the second thing is invest in a set of books. No more running this operation on spreadsheets or keeping it up here. QuickBooks, Wave Apps, Zero, whatever it is, get you some accounting software that can track all of that stuff. Because one, you can't make effective business decisions if you don't know your numbers. But two, again, when when it's time to see why a and an audit uh, is, is uh, appears. When you have crappy books, you've given the auditor a reason to dig further and challenge every single thing that yep. you put on that tax return. Yeah. So then I'm curious because obviously a lot of small business owners, new business owners, right? You might not have like a huge tax bill in year one or whatever the case may be because you might not have been too profitable. What typically, obviously when you do your tax returns, you know, there's always a chance of, you know, getting an audit, right? So what typically triggers an audit from the IRS, just based on your experience and what you've seen? Yeah, so a couple of things come to mind. Excessive um, expenses in general, right? I made uh, $1,000 this year, but I got $40,000 in losses. <laughs> like, come on, uh, that, that's gonna be that's gonna be one. That's, and, and you'd be surprised the number of people who actually do that. Wow. And they, I mean, they start claiming all kinds of stuff. Like, oh, I use my car. My car is worth hmm, $25,000, that's a write off. So it, it's nuts. So anyway, excessive deductions, um, meals and entertain. Well, now it's just meals, but the meal expense, people will run that up. Well, first of all, they got to remember outside of 2021, meals are only 50 percent deductible. So even when you put down ten thousand dollars in meals, it's only a five thousand dollar deduction. But 2021, that's different. You get a hundred percent meal deduction. Side note on that. But they usually go excessive with meals and they don't document it. Let me just tell you, meals are reserved for business purposes. It's not, hey, I just left a meeting and I'm grabbing Chick-fil-A on my way home, swipe the business card. It's I'm going to meet a prospect. I'm going to uh, you know, meet with my business partner. I'm going to do things that are relevant to income producing opportunities for my business. If it doesn't have that kind of nature, then you don't do it. And typically when you have a solo meal, it's really hard to justify that. Um, so and now, then people... I want to hit on this really quick because now doc documenting is important for this. I, I wanted you to hit on that piece as well. Like if somebody comes, if they come to audit you and you're trying to prove your prove that this was a business transaction, but this happened back in March of 2021 and this is now January of 2022. How do you prove that this is that this was a true business expense? A couple of ways. And, and I, I press all clients to keep some type of uh, um, uh, note. And there's no no silver bullet of, of how you do it, but either you have journals entries on uh, not 
not accounting journal entries, but actual like written journal entries on your um, meetings and the stuff that was discussed. You can just keep a calendar, your Outlook calendar, your Google calendar, your iCalendar that notes, hey, I'm meeting with, with Marlon to discuss X, Y, and Z. And that becomes your proof to go back and reference that, uh, that, that you all uh, have had that. Or, you know, you can keep an Excel spreadsheet. However you do it, just make sure it's easy, easy to assess or easily accessible, easy to read. And you present that as your uh, as your written proof. Got you. And then what were the other ones? Because you said the, the meals as far as the other things that triggered the audit, if there was any. Yep. Uh, so meals and entertainment. And then some people um, incorrectly claim the home office deduction. So home mm -hmm. office deduction is basically you don't have anywhere else to work. So you use a piece of your home. And they say, well, you know, um, I use my bedroom as my home office, right? So they take the whole square footage of their bedroom and try to write that off. The IRS says, no, 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 no. You only take the square footage of the space that's exclusively dedicated to your business, and that's what you can take. Uh, so you see people having excessive percentages. We typically will see five to 10%, but some people will go so far as to say, well, I use my whole garage too, you know, 35%, 40%. And they try to write that off and that's going to get you flagged um, really quick. So uh, those are just a, a few things to keep in mind. What about whenever there's a fact if you do it yourself versus having a CPA do it? Is, is that something that it also can like trigger it too? No, I haven't seen any. Uh, and there may be some out there. I just haven't been purview to. I haven't seen any evidence that supports a, a self-prepared return is more likely to be audited than a a CPA prepared return. Mm. Uh, of course, we take an extra layer of due diligence because ultimately you as the taxpayer, you're signing off on that return saying, hey, I approve uh, everything that's on here. And I'm, this is me reporting everything that's on here. Uh, but as a CPA or EA who signs that return, we're also putting our license and name on the line to say we did our due diligence to make sure everything is accurate. So if anything frivolous happens, we could be exposed too. So you get a little bit more due diligence when you go to a professional. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there's nothing to support that self-prepared is more likely to be audited than uh, so prepared. Okay, last question on this then, and then we'll move on because a lot of things keep coming to my head. As far as like the, because, you know, one I read a book, uh, it was one of the Bigger Pockets books on tax planning. Um, and one thing they talked about in there was the weekend sandwich, right? In terms of like the, uh, with the, with the trips, right? And so as a business owner, how do you properly take a, what is the correct way to do that, you know, in order to, because obviously, you know what I'm trying to say, like you, you're mm -hmm. going on a trip somewhere, but you also want to go and, you know, enjoy some of the, you know, sites wherever you're going, but you want to make it a tax deductible trip. How, what is the proper way to structure that trip in order to do that successfully? Make sure the trip has a business purpose. The most obvious way, and there are multiple ways, but the most obvious way is this is your annual company retreat or uh, you're going to a conference, right? Continuing education or something like that. So, you know, for, for me in this space, I just so happen to like Vegas. And this is true story, right? I, I like Vegas, just like a lot of people like Vegas. You know how many tax conferences happen in Vegas every single year? A lot of them. Every month you can find a tax conference in Vegas and they don't do that by mistake. In fact, I'm going to one here at the end of July. That conference happens to be a week long in Vegas. Now, I'm going to get tons of continuing education. Yeah. I'm registered for the conference, right? This this one in particular, isn't it, and this costs a couple thousand dollars, so it's not necessarily a cheap conference. So I'm actually attending, but some costs a couple hundred. And I don't know who's there to look over your shoulder to make sure you attend if you follow me. But I'm going to this conference. It happens to be in Vegas. My airfare is a deduction. My hotel stay is a deduction meals while I'm there. That's all a deduction because it's legitimately related to improving the business and the stuff that we're going to, to learn. That conference could easily be in Maui. That conference could easily be a multitude of other places, right? If you happen to like a place and it just coincidentally coincides with where you're going to host your company retreat that year, then you do it. But you want to make sure it's well documented um, what you're there for and what's, uh, what's accomplished. So I, I have my conference registration. I have my CPE. Other people will just have the conference registration or um, uh, an agenda. So if you go there and you happen to, you know, be on the slot machines and you go gambling, is that is that? No, <laughs> no. So you clearly, you, you still clearly separate the business and the personal, right? Yeah. So uh, only things that are relevant right. to the business side of things, uh, of course. Yeah, right. yeah. Cool. You know, I'm gonna have to. Uh, Otherwise, I'd be I'd be betting the whole company on black. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> hey man, I might have to have, start having a monthly company retreat. <laughs> uh man but that's funny um so okay cool well we're gonna transition kind of into the next segment and then we'll kind of wrap up the show um uh, but i really wanted to touch on this because you know just the way you started the episode was you know super apparent as to you know this is real estate is um probably to me the number one way to build wealth um for many different reasons right we have the cash flow we have the appreciation we have the loan getting paid down by the tenants and then we have the tax benefits as well right so you're able to essentially if you look on, look at it on a um on an uh, internal rate of return which is i guess to the total return you can get from an investment i think real estate can give you the best one and when you take all those things into consideration right and so that's why we see you know they say 90 percent of millionaires whatever the stat is own actually real estate um, you mentioned you, a lot of them built their wealth uh, through real estate, and then they preserved their wealth in real estate as well. So, when you say preserving your wealth in real estate, what does that actually mean from a tax perspective? In terms of like, why is real estate such a advantageous vehicle for wealthy individuals to uh, park their money in? Yeah, th that's a great question. And before I jump into that, let me say, regardless of what area in real estate you start in. Eventually, I think people start to make their way towards the buy and hold side in some capacity because you realize development, fixing and flipping, um, wholesaling, that's all transactional, right? And you got to keep that train going. But when you have an income producing asset, that protects you in a couple of different ways, which leads into the answer on your question. So protecting wealth, when you own the building, you can control the rents. What's a good way to hedge yourself against inflation as the value uh, or excuse me, as inflation starts to increase, your rents could increase lock and step, right? So now you've increased your, you've protected your wealth in a sense by not letting um, inflation eat away at it. What's another thing that eats away at wealth? Taxation. Real estate is perhaps the most favorable asset to own from a pure tax perspective, simply because of the power of depreciation. So it allows you to take in money throughout the year and depreciation is essentially a paper expense that allows you to, uh, you know, magically, to, to an extent, write off a huge portion of the rents that you're taking in. Typically, you're going to see real estate be what we call cash flow positive, but paper poor, meaning mm -hmm. you're making money throughout the year. But in terms of reporting and because of depreciation, that's triggering a uh, either a net zero or, or a loss. So you, you can protect yourself against taxes. You can protect yourself against inflation. And barring some of the changes that are going to happen with Joe Biden's tax plan, as it stands right now, you can pass that to the next generation and they receive what we call a step up in basis. That means I bought this property at one hundred and fifty thousand. You know, I had it for X amount of time. Something happens to me. I pass away. My son gets that property, but he gets it at the appreciated value at the date of my death. Right. So my one hundred and fifty thousand is now worth two hundred and fifty. He can now have that two hundred and fifty K. If he turns around and sells it, there's little to no capital gains that are that are associated with it. Uh, or he can continue to hold on to it and pass it down and pass it down. And what also happens there, it's now worth 250 mm -hmm. cash out refi. You know, so you got all kind of things. Exactly. Tax free. So you have all kind of ways that you can take a asset in, in the real estate space to protect the wealth and continue to, to, to build more. And so it's absolutely some area, an area that everyone has to consider. And it, be, and it gives you it really gives you the largest step, stepping stone to make jumps into newer tax brackets a lot quicker because you could sell that property, go and jump into some multifamily and then start to grow it in that space as well. So a lot of value there. Oh, man, I love it. Y'all got to listen to that again. Yeah. Like, go back and listen to that. Because I want to touch on that, too, just in terms of I, the, the, the what you mentioned with the depreciation, because that's my favorite part about you know real estate it appreciates in value but you get to depreciate the value essentially right um yep. and obviously you know if you own commercial versus residential it's different but i okay so i just i'll just i just want to help people understand because it's a, a confusing concept for a lot of people in terms of what's actually going on so i always try to give like a very simple example right because i always say if a property can generate you 200 dollars per month in true cash flow after you put all your expenses and the you know, variable expenses of way. Let's say you make two hundred dollars a month. That's twelve hundred dollars, or that's twenty four hundred dollars per year. You can depreciate mm -hmm. that uh, the value of that property, right? So we have the value of the um, property, and we subtract the value of the land, 
And then we can take that over the 27 and a half years for residential real estate. So if it was, yep. you know, a hundred thousand dollar property, you take away, let's say the land is worth 20,000, divide that, uh, you get 80,000, divide that over 27 and a half, you get a little over $2,400, right? And right. so yep. with that, if you made $2,400 in profit, now you essentially don't have to pay anything in taxes on that money because now that depreciation allows you to essentially take a paper loss, like you said. Yep. And so the this is so great because we're trying to get into the commercial real estate stuff in terms of syndications and all that kind of stuff. And one of my biggest selling factors to investors is not even a fact of like the cash flow that you're going to get. It's mm -hmm. the the fact because you got to think a lot of people that invest into the syndications, which is pretty much when you pull money together. A lot of these people are like W-2 workers. And as yeah. we discussed, these are the people that get taxed the most. So for them, investing into a large apartment building is very beneficial just based on the taxes because now they're part owners. They can depreciate that $500 million, whatever value of that building is over 39 years, and they can take a part of that as well. And now they can – you can make – and this is why a lot of like high W-2 earners, they can make a lot of money from their job. They invest in a couple apartment buildings. They can pay nothing in taxes. Yeah. And they don't even have to be in, involved in the management of the apartment. They're passive investors. And it's yeah. like real estate is just a cheat code for it is it well, is the ultimate cheat code, <laughs> the ultimate cheat code. Um, and I'll tell you, uh, this, this is for newer investors. It's hard to wrap their mind around how this actually works and why it works. Uh, but the way you articulate it, the way you explain it, I think is really good. It's, it's in layman's terms like, hey, you're, you're going to invest fifty thousand dollars. You know, actually. Um, Y'all familiar with Alvin Johnson, right? Yeah, yeah. Alvin Hope Johnson. Okay, perfect. So Alvin and I uh, have had several talks uh, specifically around, around a deal we're working on that's uh, that's over in Princeton. And one of the examples that I use when, when we're talking to investors is, look, you're going to invest $100,000, okay? Over the first three years, you're going to get a $15,000 return based on our, our, our uh, performer that we put together, how the, how the uh, property will perform and some reasonable es estimations. We conservatively, conservatively think you're going to get fifteen thousand dollars a year over the first three years. What fun? What fun, what's fun in that is that that fifteen thousand essentially comes back to them tax free because of the power of depreciation. Okay, so you put in a hundred over three years. I got forty five. It's fifteen a year, right? Then, just like all other burst strategies, right? You get to the refinance part. You pull out equity from the appreciation. We're talking about a forty million dollar property. Yeah. So. At year three, now you're getting probably a sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollar distribution. So you've effectively gotten all your money back. And what happens when you do a refi? That's debt. That's not that's not income. So it's not taxable. So now you're winning. You're in the black. You've gotten money, and you've paid no taxes over the next couple of years. Power of depreciation still continues to work. So you're getting uh, what what they call negative K one. So you're still getting those fifteen thousand dollar distributions, but you're paying little to no tax on it. Then the big exit happens at the end, right? Yes. Seven year hold, we're, we're estimating about a $14 million profit. Seven million of that goes to the uh, the uh, limited partner investors, right? So that's spread, seven million spread between those people. Um, they essentially get that large capital gain. They likely have, because they're high income earners, suspended losses that they couldn't use in the early years that now absorb and offset the capital gain. So now, not only have you gotten your money back, you've gotten your money back plus about $150,000 and paid little to no tax on it. You can't do that in any other line of business. Like, that's the power of real estate right there. And, I, and it's just so crazy because to think that's even legal, right? Because, I mean, with, with, with any business, like, you, even just in the sense of, like, the leverage aspect, you talked about it's tax – because it's debt, it's tax-free, right? You're getting paid tax-free money essentially on a business you might have no experience in. Right. Because yep. there is no other business you can go to and get a let's even look at on a residential scale. You get a three and a half percent loan on FHA. There's no business you can go get a ninety six and a half percent leverage loan. And then <laughs> essentially be, it could be tax free as, if we want to think about it like that. Right. Because yep. it's debt. It's insane, bro. <laughs> yeah, man. Like and, and, and I, I just that's why I'm always so big on telling people like, like you got to get into real estate in some capacity, even if capacity. you're not going to own like physically be a general partner or manage something and be a syndicate invest in someone's 
syndication passively or something partnerships man partnerships are the key there uh it's so many it's so many ways to get in in these spaces at, at a very low cost you can do short-term rental arbitrage right you can do wholesaling uh, where you assign the contracts it's a lot of ways to cut your teeth and make the money and then roll into the larger buy and hold side but that should always be the end game to do the transactional side is great but all you're doing is essentially buying yourself a job because the moment you stop doing deals the cash stops but on the rental side, or excuse me, we're on the buy and hold side, I haven't seen where rents have slid backwards. I only see rents constantly going up, right? And the the, the way that this, I mean, even the, even the changes that are proposed in the tax code, real estate will still be a favorable space to play in. Yeah. And then obviously, even as inflation is becoming something that's more, you know, big and bigger, but, you know, it only benefits you. Inflation benefits you when you hold assets, yeah. right? Because yeah. the assets increase in value along you with- You control everything. the balance. Yeah. So your rents go up, value of property goes up, everything goes up, cash out refis go up, everything, man. So I love and then just the last point I want to touch on too, because you talked about the step up basis too. Um that I think that's a super great point. Cause I think that's like obviously with wealthy people, uh, we know wealthy people, they are thinking many, many generations down the line, right? Poor people don't mm-hmm. even think about that kind of stuff. So even having that knowledge of like the step up basis and stuff, that alone, and I know, you know, th- I think Biden said he wanted to take it away for any gains over $1 million. Um, I don't remember if, if what the number was exactly. But even then, it's still you're still going to, I mean, I, it obviously just depends on any asset. But I don't, by that time, I mean, we're talking 50 years, who knows what it's going to look like. So yeah. um, it's just, a, it, it's all around the greatest asset in the world, in my opinion, just because you can eat from it in different ways. So yeah. Um, yeah. I just think, uh, just, just to summarize it all, man, just like bringing it back home. I, that's why I love talking about the four quadrants of income, like the employee, the self-employed, and the business owner, and investor. Everybody may not be made to be a business owner, but at the end of the day, everybody should be taking that their their salary or their, their way of bring, bringing in income and investing that because the, the investments is where you are able to get all these different tax strategies, all these different benefits, so you can uh, make and keep more of your money as opposed to complaining that everybody else is the business owner, business owners and investors are uh, paying little to no taxes and you're paying all of it. There's ways around it, but you got to be surrounded by the right information. This yeah. is why we bring people like you on the podcast. So I just appreciate you for coming on, man. Thank you. I, I definitely appreciate it. Yeah, so we're, what we're going to do is go into our very last segment, which is just the fast five, where we'll ask you five questions and you'll answer them in 10 seconds or less. Um, sure. Briefly, though, I know you mentioned you had an offer for people as far as, did you say you had like a webinar or something that people can go join? I, I don't know if you said you yeah, said that there was something. I just want yeah. to Oh yeah. So so we're we're doing a a workshop and we're hitting different cities. So far we have Dallas, Atlanta, um, New York, D.C., and uh, one other place lined up. But if you if you visit the website, you can see what is a tax and asset protection workshop. And what it's essentially doing is teaching individuals, specifically business owners that, or excuse me, I should say specifically folks that are in the real estate space, is teaching everything from the basic entity structure and foundation and the multi entity layer on into how do you create the tax plan marry that with the asset protection so that those two work together and ultimately create the estate plan so that it tra- it transfers to your uh, family in a, uh, in a tax efficient way. So all of these intricate tax things that we've talked about, we're giving away basically all of the strategies, not all, but most of the strategies that we use with our, uh, with our clients to uh, not only pay very little in taxes, so you got the tax plan, but make sure the assets are protected and make sure it goes to the next generation in the most tax efficient way. So it's a half day workshop that we're doing. Dope, 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 man, dope. Cool. So, y'all definitely got to go check that out. Go to the website and check that out. What was the website again? Uh, so it's LarryDWestTheThird.com. So LarryDWestIII.com. Got you, got sure. you, got you. Okay, cool. So, what we're gonna do? We're gonna wrap it up, man. This is this episode could go so long because there's so much to talk about. It could be like a ten part series if you want to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> This is, I know a lot of people, you know, you, tech, tax is not a sexy subject to a lot of people, but, you know, once you really get into it, you, I promise it'll be sexy once you know it can do, what, what, once you know the right stuff. Yeah. Um. So, I'm going to take the first question, and Marlon take the next one, and we'll alternate. So, uh, this is called the Fast Five. We answer five questions, and you answer in 10 seconds or less. You ain't mentioned that. All right. Question. No, I, <laughs> perfect. I did. Perfect. Yeah. Pressure's on. Let's do it. Um. Okay, first question. Uh, what does success mean to you? Uh, having time for my family and my kids. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, question number two. What is your favorite money or business book? Ooh, that's a good one. I don't know that I can do that in 10 seconds or less. Uh, <laughs> you know, as a business book, it's, it's going to be Blue Ocean Strategy. 
Mm. Who's that bar? Uh, I forget their name. It's, it's two people on there, uh, but they really talk about how do you create uh, a competitive market, uh, you know, out of basically building a blue ocean where no one else is, not just mirroring the competition. Yeah, but I love the blue ocean straight. I love that concept. I haven't heard the, heard the book, but I got to check it out. Renee Marburn and W. Chan Kim. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, third question. Would you rather have $1,000 a week for life or a million dollars today? Million dollars today. And why? Million dollars today because uh, time value of money. Money today is worth more than money tomorrow. And I could do some things today to probably make more than a thousand dollars a week. Yeah. Love that response. The inflation alone is a really a good <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. reason as to why to take the million. Fast. Now question number four. If you could go back and change anything about your journey, what would it be? Nothing. I feel like everything is kind of made made me who I am today and kind of set the foundation for where we are. Oh, last question. Where can people find out more about you? Uh, easily. Go to the website, LarryDWestTheThird.com. Instagram is the same name, LarryDWestTheThird. Post tons of information there. Um, I think that's where you get uh, a lot of the info. Dope, man. Dope, dope, dope. Well, this has been an amazing, amazing episode. I think uh, this is our number one tax episode for sure i mean we haven't done too many but this has been a, a great great conversation and i might have found my new cpa so uh, I'm, uh <laughs> hopefully a lot of other people have too yeah man i'm definitely gonna be uh, reaching out to you so that you know we can talk because i i'm actually been looking for a cpa and i think uh i definitely want to want you to do that for me so uh this has been dope though so we appreciate you coming on here man Thank y'all. I appreciate the time. I definitely do. And I appreciate the invite. So hopefully everyone got a, a ton of value. Uh, and of course, any additional questions, you got my information. So let's follow up and uh, let me know how I can best help. That's it for this episode of the Money Monopolizers podcast. New episodes will be released every Thursday and will be available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and YouTube. Just search Money Monopolizers wherever you listen to podcasts. We hope you learned something of value today. And if we did, if you did, we'd appreciate it if you rated us five stars. And left us a review on Apple Podcasts. You can find out more info about us on Twitter at The Monopolizers or IG at Money Monopolizers. We post informative content on there that'll keep you engaged, so be sure to check that out at Cheryl's post. But until then, we are out of here. You've been listening to The Money Monopolizers Podcast. Helping you take control of your financial destiny. To learn more about how you can be in control of your money, visit MoneyMonopolizers.com. We'll catch you next time when Alex and Marlon share more personal finance and wealth creation tips. Now it's time to take action.